Hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host Jeff Williams here for another jam-packed action-filled information overload. And I just had the logo in front of my face, so I'm glad to see we're back to normal here and the way things should be. Uh, welcome to our show for the 12th of April, 2018. Uh, before we begin today, because we got a lot of content, I have to offer up congratulations to Lindsay Whalen, who plays for the Minnesota Lynx. She used to be a member of the University of Minnesota Women's Golden Goal for Basketball program from back in uh, the early 2000s. She has just been named the newest head coach for the University of Minnesota women's basketball program. I've known Lindsay for many, many years. I just sent her off a congratulatory message a moment ago, and I look forward to seeing, uh, as I hope you do too, uh, seeing some more success out of that program. I think that uh, Mark Coyle, the athletic director from the Gophers, uh, may have hit a home run with that pick. Now we're going to go into today's Prager University segment and that's really going to kind of lead us into the program for today and this all has to deal with technology. So what happens when Google disagrees with you? Here's Prager University. I used to be a senior software engineer at Google until they fired me for doing something unforgivable, something so controversial that it was the number one news story for days. My crime, I wrote an internal document that among other things, suggested that men and women on average are different. Like I told you, unforgivable. The politically progressive viewpoint, which is dominant at Google and in the media, is that all disparities in society are due to injustices, or in this case, that the gender gap in tech is solely due to some form of sexism. But is this true? The politically correct answer is yes, and Google acts accordingly. It treats men and women differently during hiring and promotion, holds official women-only events, and gives mandatory sensitivity training on how to combat alleged sexist bias. Of course, all of this makes sense if sexism is indeed the sole cause of the imbalance. But what if men and women are not exactly the same? Then sexism is just one of many possible causes of the imbalance and exclusionary programs and differential treatment can be a counterproductive form of sexism. These practices actually increase tensions and make some feel like Google cares more about their gender than their programming ability. As an engineer, when I'm faced with a problem, I want to solve it. So I decided to research the premise that men and women are exactly the same. I wrote my findings in a 10-page document titled Google's Ideological Echo Chamber. You can read it online. What did I discover? That not all of the male-female disparity in tech may be the result of sexism. That at least some of it may be attributed to men and women having different goals for their careers and their lives. To cite just two examples, in the study Women, Careers, and Work-Life Preferences, published in the British Journal of Guidance and Counseling, the study's authors conclude that women across populations tend to look for more work-life balance, while men tend to have a higher drive for status. And according to a study by Cal State Fullerton psychologist Richard Lippa, men, on average, tend to be more interested in things, while women tend to be more interested in people. These findings have been replicated many times. They've actually been cited by other researchers as a cause for the gender gap in tech. In other words, I didn't make this stuff up. In fact, after my document came under attack, evolutionary psychologist Jeffrey Miller said its empirical claims were scientifically accurate. But Google disagreed, like really disagreed. First, the company's newly appointed VP of Diversity, Integrity, and Governance, Danielle Brown, posted a memo that said my report advanced incorrect assumptions about gender. Google CEO Sundar Pichai sent a memo to all employees saying that I crossed the line by advancing harmful gender stereotypes. This was, he added, not OK. Then he fired me. By that point, much to my shock, my document had gone viral. News outlets were branding it an anti-diversity manifesto. But if they had read what I wrote, they could see for themselves that it was pro-diversity. I had suggested multiple ways that we could get more women into tech without resorting to counterproductive discrimination. Ironic, isn't it? 
The company that hires some of the smartest people in the world couldn't handle a well-reasoned scientific discussion. But my firing pales in comparison to the larger issue. Will Google force upon its users the same politically correct views that it forces upon its employees? The evidence is disturbing. Google already manipulates its products to fit a certain viewpoint. Just one example, YouTube, Google's video platform, restricts access to dozens of PragerU videos, along with videos made by other influential moderates and conservatives. Yes, Google is a business and can set its own policies, but for its billions of users, Google is their main gateway to information, the lens through which they view the world. This makes Google, in some ways, more powerful than even the government. And that means Google has a special responsibility to, well, simply follow its own motto, don't be evil. I'm James Damore for Prager University. Now keep that in the forefront of your mind when you watch the rest of today's show. Because, well first, before I, before I get into the rest of the today's show, we are on YouTube. YouTube.com slash North Star Oasis. We are also on Facebook. Facebook.com slash North Star Oasis. This show is a regular user of Google and Facebook products. We use that as a platform. YouTube is owned by Google. Get that straight. Google doesn't just have search. They don't just have mail. They also own a whole bunch of subsidiary companies, and they bought YouTube, which we're on. Facebook also owns a lot of subsidiary companies, which we're on. So as we talk about tech today, because that's what we're going to be discussing. Keep in mind that you have tech companies that are running things, and are they running things the right way? That was the subject this week in Congress. On uh, Tuesday in the U.S. Senate, Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook, was grilled for like five hours by members of the U.S. Senate. On Wednesday, yesterday, Mark Zuckerberg was grilled for another five hours by members of the U.S. House of Representatives. And a lot of this stems from the, uh, the um, Cambridge Analytica scandal about data mining from the 2016 presidential election. That's what brings this to the forefront. But Facebook's a tool. Gmail or Google's a tool then the question that you should always be thinking about is what is the role of these tools in day-to-day -day activity? Because that goes in with Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which um, provides immunity from liability for, pro for providers and users of an electronic, uh, of an, uh, I'm reading it here, in a, of an interactive computer service who publish information provided by others no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. In other words, you're going to hear the words platform. YouTube's a platform. Google's a platform. Facebook is a platform. And in analyzing the availability of the immunity offered by this provision, courts generally apply a three-prong test. A defendant must satisfy each of the three prongs to gain the benefit of the immunity. Section 1, the defendant must be a provider or user of an interactive computer service. So if, you, if you're wrong, and you, um, okay, the defendant must be. Second, the cause of action asserted by the plaintiff must treat the defendant as the publisher or speaker of the harmful information at issue. Then the information for prong 3 must be provided by another information content provider. So the way this should work for Section 230 is you have an interactive computer service and they're essentially a moderator, they're kind of a, a referee. Hey, you, we, we built a tool and we're having limited standards and we're not going to you know, get involved with censorship of speech. That's really what it comes down to. And what happens when they start crossing that line? When YouTube and Google starts monitoring and filtering out, out uh, the content of search or the content of, of um, YouTube videos, do they start crossing the line on the immunity of the Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act? That's one of the biggest questions. The other, of course, is privacy. And so 
keep Section 230 in the forefront of your mind. Because right now, we are actually going to take a look at what Steve Scalise had to uh, say, or his questioning with Mark Zuckerberg. Gentleman from Louisiana, the whip of the house, Mr. Scalise, for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, I appreciate you coming here. I know, as uh, some of my other colleagues mentioned, uh, you came here voluntarily, and we appreciate the opportunity to have this discussion, uh, because clearly what your company's been able to do has revolutionized the way that people can connect, and there's a tremendous benefit to our country. Uh, now it's a worldwide platform, and uh, it's, it's helped create a shortage of computer programmers. So as a former computer programmer, I think uh, we would both agree that we need to encourage more people to go into the computer sciences because our country is a world leader, uh, thanks to your company and so many others. But it obviously raises questions about privacy and data and how the data is shared and what is a user's expectation of where that data goes. So I want to ask a few questions. Uh, first, would you agree that we need more computer programmers and people to go into that field? Congressman, yes. That's a public service announcement we just made, so appreciate you uh, joining me in that. Um, and Mr. Shimkus's question, it was really a follow-up to a question yesterday uh, that, that you weren't able to answer, but it was dealing with how Facebook tracks users, especially after they log off. And you had said, in relation to uh, Congressman Shimkus's question, uh, that there is data mining, but it goes on for security purposes. So my question would be, is that data that is mined for security purposes also used to sell as part of the business model? Congressman, I believe that those are, are, that we collect different data for those, but I can follow up on the details of, of All right, if you could follow up, I would appreciate that. Um, getting into this, this new realm of content review, I know some of the people that work for Facebook, Campbell Brown said, for example, this is changing our relationship with publishers and emphasizing something that Facebook has never done before. It's having a point of view. And you mentioned the Diamond and Silk example where uh, there, you, you, I think, described it as a mistake. Uh, were the people who made that mistake held accountable in any way? Uh, Congressman, let me follow up with you on that. That situation developed while I was here preparing to testify, so I'm not okay. in the details. Of it. I do want to ask you about a study that was done uh, dealing with the algorithm that Facebook uses to describe uh, what is fed to people through the news feed, and what they found was after this new algorithm was implemented, uh, that there was a tremendous bias against conservative news and content and a favorable bias towards liberal content. And if you can look at that, that shows a 16-point disparity, which is concerning. Uh, I would imagine you're not going to want to share the algorithm itself with us. I'd encourage if you wanted to do that. But uh, who develops the algorithm? I wrote algorithms before, and you can determine uh, whether or not you want to write an algorithm to sort data, to compartmentalize data, but you can also put a bias in if that's the directive. Was there a directive to put a bias in? And first, are you aware of this bias that many people have looked at and analyzed and seen? Congressman, this is a really important question. There is absolutely no directive in any of the changes that we make to have a bias in anything that we do. To the contrary, our goal is to be a platform for all ideas. And, all right, and, and I know we're, we're almost out of time, so if you can go back and look and determine if there was a bias. Whoever developed that software, you have 20,000 people that work on uh, some of this uh, data analysis. If you can look and see if there is a bias and let us know w if there is and what you're doing about it, because that is disturbing when you see that kind of disparity. Uh, finally, there's been a lot of talk about uh, Cambridge and what they've done in the last campaign. In 2008 and 2012, there was also a lot of this done. Uh, one of the lead digital uh, heads of the Obama campaign said recently, Facebook was surprised we were able to suck out the whole social graph, but they didn't stop us once they realized that was what we were doing. They came to office in the days following the election recruiting and were very candid that they allowed us to do things they wouldn't have allowed someone else to do because they were on our side. Now, that's a direct quote from one of the heads of the Obama digital team. What, what would she mean by they, Facebook, were on our side? Congressman, we didn't allow the Obama campaign to do anything that any developer on the platform wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. So she no was making thing. an inaccurate yeah. statement in your point of view? Yes. All right. Gentlemen, appreciate the comments and uh, look forward to those answers. You'll back the balance of my time. Chair now recognizes the gentleman.
or a fissure. So already we're seeing that back in 2008 and 2012, as Facebook was in its growth phase, the Obama campaign did something similar to what happened in 16. Why didn't Facebook address the problem then? Because apparently it was known. And so I have to commend Congressman Scalise for asking that question. And he also brought up a good point about you know, the, you know, his original quote about uh, the publishing. And that's really what comes down to the editorializing and being a publisher. Are they a publisher of content and through the selective editorial standards? Or are they that equal platform for uh, you know, a fair voice for all? Well, Zuckerberg repeatedly says, well, we're here to make a platform, but then there's evidence showing the contrary, which shows that a violation of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act may have occurred. And that's a very, very big overriding uh, or underlying uh, question that's, you know, that's coming up through some of these different clips. Now, by, mind you, we're only giving you selected clips here. You can go to cspan.org and you can watch the entire 10 hours of testimony. Uh, I've watched probably about a tenth of it. Uh, Dallas, our producer, has probably watched uh, maybe 65, 70 percent of it. And, Oh, 80 or 90, he corrects me. So, you know, we, we've gone through and called a lot of these. And in putting these t clips together, what we were looking at was more so on that Section 230, the Communications Decency Act, more so than any of the other stuff that members of Congress were dancing around. Clearly, we had seen that there's some members of Congress who aren't really up to date on technology and don't really understand a lot of this. Some of them who do. Then there's some of, some of them who wanted to go into other areas like uh, fair housing, which kind of takes away from the point of this discussion. So when we selected these clips, we wanted to take a look more so at how it applied to Section 230 than these other underlying issues. So we selected clips not based upon who was speaking or what the party affiliation was, but as to whether or not they were addressing Section 230, the Communications Decency Act. So I wanted to put that disclaimer out here because I know we're heavy on Republican clips, but and Democrats spoke and, and some of them had some very valid concerns. And that's the, re that's the way we selected this. So now we're going to hear from Deb Fisher, Senator from Nebraska. Thera Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for being here today. I appreciate your testimony. Uh, the full scope of a Facebook user's activity can print a um, very personal picture, I think. And additionally, you have those two billion uh, users that are out there every month, and so we all know that's larger than the population of most countries. So how many data categories do you store? Does Facebook store on the categories that you collect? Senator, can you clarify what you mean by data well, there's, categories? Well, there's some past reports that have been out there that indicate that, it, that Facebook collects about 96 data categories for those two billion active users, that's 192 billion data points that are being generated, I think, at any time uh, from consumers globally. So how many do you, does Facebook store out of that? Do you store any? Senator, I'm not actually sure what that is referring to. On, on the points that you collect uh, information, if we call those categories, how many do you store of information that you are collecting? Senator, the, the way I think about this is there are two broad categories. I, I, this probably doesn't line up with whatever the, the specific report that you were seeing is, and I can make sure that we follow up with you afterwards to get you the information you need on that. The two broad categories that I think about are content that a person has chosen to share and that they have complete control over. They get to control when they put it into the service, when they take it down, um, who sees it. And then the other category are uh, data that are connected to uh, making the ads relevant. You have complete control over both. You can turn off the data related to ads. You, you can choose not to share any content or control exactly who sees it or take down the content in the former category. And do you, does Facebook store any of that? Yes. 
how much do you store of that? All of it? All of it? Everything we click on? Is that in storage somewhere? Senator, we store data about what people share on the service and information that's required to do ranking better, to show you what you care about in newsfeed. Do you, do you store uh, text history, user content, um, activity, device location? Senator, some of that content, with people's permission, we do store. Do you um, disclose any of that? Yes, it, it, Senator, in order to, for people to share that information with Facebook, I, I believe that almost everything that you just said would be opt-in. Right. And the privacy settings, it's my understanding that they limit the sharing of that data with other Facebook users, is that correct? Senator, yes. Okay. Every person gets to control who gets to see their content. And does that also limit the ability for Facebook to collect and use it? Senator, yes, there are other, uh, there are controls that uh, determine what Facebook can do as well. So for example, people have a control about face recognition. If people don't want us to uh, be able to help identify when they're in photos that their friends upload, um, then they can turn that off. Right. And, and then we won't store that kind of template for them. And, and there was uh, some action taken by the FTC in 2011. And you wrote a Facebook post at the time um, it, on a public page on the internet that it used to seem scary to people. But as long as they could make their page private, they felt safe sharing with their friends online. Control was key. And you just mentioned control. Uh, Senator Hatch um, um, asked you a question and you responded there about complete control. So you and your company have used that term repeatedly. And I believe you use it to reassure users, is that correct? That you do have control and complete control over this information? Well, Senator, this is how the service works. Is, I mean, the core thing that Facebook is, and all of our services, WhatsApp, right. Instagram, Messenger. So is this, a, is this then a question of uh, Facebook is about feeling safe or are users actually safe? Is Facebook, is Facebook being safe? Senator, I think Facebook is safe. I use it and my family use it and all the people I love and care about use it all the time. These controls are not just to make people feel safe, it's actually what people want in the product. The reality is, is that when you, I mean, just think about how you use this yourself. You don't wanna share, like you take a photo, you're not gonna always send that to the same people. Sometimes you're gonna to wanna to text it to one person, sometimes you might send it to a group, I bet you have a page. You'll probably want to put stuff, some stuff out there publicly so you can communicate with your constituents. There are all these different groups of people that someone might want to connect with, and those controls are very important in practice for the operation of the service, not just to build trust, although I think that they, providing people with control also does that, but actually in order to make it so that people can fulfill their goals with the service. Senator Coons. Thank you. Mr. Zuckerberg, thanks for being here. Uh, and that was, I, I thought, co content-wise, it was a good exchange. Uh, Senator Fisher, I think, could have probably done a little bit better job in asking your questions. Um, I personally think I saw a few evasive answers from uh, Zuckerberg regarding, you know, safety. You know, is it an illusion or are people actually safe? Now, of course, a CEO of a company is going to come out and say, oh, well, I, I used it and I, I think it's safe, but... You know, he's got a uh, financial interest in, in, in that. But really, is Facebook safe? Well, then, if it isn't safe, or if it is safe, then why do we have Cambridge Analytica and the Obama teams doing data mining, or data scraping, as it's also termed? Um, so evidently, it isn't safe, because if it was safe, we wouldn't be in a congressional testimony. Uh, we're going to also go now to Nebraska Senator uh, Ben Sass. Mr. Zuckerberg, thanks for being here. Uh, at current pace, uh, you're due to be done with first round of questioning by about 1 a.m., so congratulations. Um, I, I like Chris Coons a lot, uh, with his own family or with Dan Sullivan's family. Both are great photos. Uh, but I want to ask a similar set of questions from the other side, maybe. 
Uh, I think the, the line, the conceptual line between mere tech company, mere tools, and an actual content company, I think it's really hard. I think you guys have a hard challenge. I think regulation over time will have a hard challenge. Um, and you're a private company, so you can make policies uh, that may be uh, less than First Amendment full spirit embracing, in my view. But I worry about that. I worry about a world where when you go from violent groups to hate speech in a hurry in one of your responses to one of the opening questions, um, you may decide, or Facebook may decide, it needs to police a whole bunch of speech um, that I think America might be better off not having policed by one company that has a really big and powerful platform. Can you define hate speech? Senator, I think that this is a really hard question. And I think it's one of the reasons why we struggle with it. There are certain definitions that, that, we, that we have around um, you know, calling for, for violence or... Um, Let's just agree on that. If somebody's calling yeah. for violence, we, that shouldn't be there. I'm worried about the psychological categories around speech. You, you used language of safety and protection earlier. We see this happening on college campuses all across the country. It's dangerous. 40% of Americans under age 35 tell pollsters they think the First Amendment is dangerous because you might use your freedom to say something that hurts somebody else's feelings. Guess what? There are some really passionately held views about the abortion issue on this panel today. Can you imagine a world uh, where you might decide that pro-lifers are prohibited from speaking about their abortion views on your content, on your platform? I certainly would not want that to be the case. But it, it might really be unsettling to people who've had an abortion to have an open debate about that, wouldn't it? It might be, but I don't think that that would, uh, would fit any of the definitions of, of, of what we have. But I do generally agree with the point that you're making, which is as, we sh as we're able to technologically shift towards especially having AI proactively look at content, I think that that's going to create massive questions for society about what obligations we want to require companies to, to fulfill. And, and I do think that that's a question that uh, we need to struggle with as a country, because I know other countries are, and they're putting laws in place. And I, I think that America needs to uh, figure out and create the set of principles that we want American companies to operate under. Thanks. I, I wouldn't want you to leave here today and think there's sort of a unified view in the Congress that you should be moving toward policing more and more and more speech. I think violence has no place on your platform. Uh, sex traffickers and human traffickers have no place on your platform. But vigorous debates, adults need to engage in vigorous debates. I, I have only a little less than two minutes left, so I want to shift gears a little bit. But that was about adults. Um, you're a dad. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about social media addiction. You started uh, your comments today Today by talking about how Facebook is and was founded as an optimistic company. You and I have had conversations separate from here. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think as you've aged, you might be a little bit less idealistic and optimistic uh, than you were when you, when you started Facebook. As a dad, uh, do you worry about social media addiction as a problem for America's teens? Well, my hope is, is that we can be idealistic but have a broad view of our responsibility. Uh, to your, your point about teens, this is certainly something that I think any parent thinks about, is how much do you want your kids using technology? It, it, at Facebook specifically, uh, I view our responsibility as not just building services that people like, but building services that are good for people and good for society as well. So we study a lot of effects of well-being of our, of our tools and broader technology. And you know, like any tool, um, there are good and, and bad uses of it. What we find in general is that if you're using social media uh, in order to build relationships, right? so you're, you're sharing content with friends, you're interacting, then that is associated with all of the long-term measures of well-being that you would intuitively think of. Long-term health, long-term happiness, long-term feeling connected, feeling less lonely. But if you're using the internet and social media um, primarily to just passively consume content and you're not engaging with other people, then it doesn't have those positive effects and it could be negative. We're, we're almost at time, so I want to I ask you one more. Uh, do social media companies hire consulting firms to help them figure out how to get more dopamine feedback loops so that people don't want to leave the platform? No, Senator. That's not how we talk about this or, or, or how we uh, set up our product teams. We want our products to be valuable to people, and if they're valuable, then people choose to use them. Are you aware of other social media companies that do hire such consultants? So, so not sitting here today. Thanks. Senator Markey. 
Now, when Zuckerberg was talking about AI, artificial intelligence, AI can't distinguish anything. The only thing artificial intelligence can distinguish is what the programmers tell it to do. You still require programmers to tell it what to search for, to tell it, you know, what the rules governing AI are to be. And if the rules say that, well, we're going to let this kind of speech go through and we're going to restrict this kind of speech, that still requires the programmers to do that. So as much as Zuckerberg can talk about, oh, we got AI doing this search and that search, who is programming the AI? That's, that could be problematic. You're going to be hearing actually that coming up here uh, very soon. Now we're actually going to turn the page just a little bit here and take a look at national security and social media, uh, courtesy of Representative Richard Hudson from North Carolina. Hudson for four minutes. All right here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for being here. This is a long day. Uh, you're here voluntarily, and we sure appreciate you, you being here. I can say from my own experience, I've uh, hosted two events with Facebook in my district in North Carolina. Uh, working with small business and finding ways they can increase their customer base on Facebook and it's been very beneficial to us So I thank you for that. Um, I do want to pivot slightly and frame the discussion in another light for my question One of the greatest honors I have is I represent the uh, men and women at Fort Bragg the epicenter of the universe home of the airborne special operations You mm -hmm. visited last year. I did very well received uh, So you understand that uh, due to the sense of nature of uh, some of the operations these soldiers conduct that many are discouraged or even prohibited from having a social media presence. However, there are others who, who still have profiles. There are some who may have deleted their profiles uh, upon entering military service. Many have family members uh, who have Facebook profiles. Um, and as we've learned, each one of these users' information may have been shared without their consent. There's no way that Facebook can guarantee the safety of this information on another company's server if they sell this information. If private information could be gathered by apps without explicit consent, uh, of the user they're almost asking to be hacked. Uh, are you aware of the national security concerns that would come from allowing those who seek to harm our nation access to information such as the geographical location of members of our armed services? Is this something that you're, you're looking at? Uh, Congressman, I'm not, I'm not specifically aware of, of that threat, uh, but in general, there are a number of national security and election integrity type issues that we focus on. Um, and we try to take a very broad view of that. And the more input that we can get from the intelligence community as well, um, encour encouraging us to, to look into specific things, the more effectively we could do that work. Great, well, I'd love to follow up with you on that. Um, it's been said many times here that you refer to Facebook as a platform of all ideas, or platform for all ideas. I know you've heard from many yesterday and today about concerns regarding Facebook censorship of content particularly content that may promote Christian beliefs or conservative political beliefs. Um, I have to bring up Dominant Silk again because they're actually from my district. Um, but but you, I think you've addressed these concerns, uh, but I think it's also become very apparent, and I hope it's become very apparent to you that this is a very serious concern. Um, I actually asked on my Facebook page for my constituents to give me ideas of things they'd like me to ask you today, and the most common question was about personal privacy. Uh, so this is something that I, I think there is an issue. Uh, there, there's an issue that your company, uh, in terms of trust with consumers, I think you need to deal with. I think you recognize that based on your testimony today. Uh, but my question to you is, what is the standard that Facebook uses to determine what is offensive or controversial, um, and how's that standard been applied across Facebook's platform? Congressman, this is an important question. So there are a couple of standards. The, the strongest one is things that will cause uh, physical harm or threats of physical harm. But then there's a broader standard of, um, of hate speech and speech that might make people feel um, just broadly uncomfortable or unsafe in the community. And that's probably it's, the most difficult to define. It, so I guess is, my question it, is, how is do you very, apply, what standards do you apply to try to determine what's hate speech versus what's just speech you may disagree with? Congressman, that's a very important question and I think is, is one that we struggle with continuously. And the question of what is hate speech versus what is legitimate political speech is, I think, something that we get um, criticized both from the left and the right on what the definitions are that we have. It's, um, it is, it's nuanced, and what we try, to, we try to lay this out in our community standards, which are public documents that we can make sure that you and your, your office get um, to look through the definitions on this. Um, but this is an area where I think 
society's sensibilities are also shifting quickly, and it's also uh, very different in different. I'm just countries. run out of time here. I hate to cut you off, but let me just say that uh, you know, based on the statistics Mr. Scalise shared and the anecdotes we can provide you, it seems like there's still Gentlemen's a challenge when it comes to conservative. And I hope you'll address that. I agree. So with right. that, Mr. Chairman, I will stop Gentlemen's talking. Time. Now, with that exchange, there's nothing that is more nuanced than setting up the rules for AI. If you want to know more, go and look up rules-based AI, rules-based artificial intelligence. And then, when you learn more about that, ask yourself what rules will they come up with, especially if they are along one ideology. You know, Silicon Valley is mainly more on the progressive liberal democratic side of the aisle. Unlike, say, Utah, which would be more on the conservative Republican side of the aisle. If Silicon Valley was in Utah uh, with a bunch of conservatives, you better believe that the Democratic Party would be having the same type of uh, testimony. But the biggest thing is, going back to Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, it should, the rules should be pretty even. And I'm talking not just the rules of AI, but just in the rules of governing the uh, company. So now here's Kathy McMorris Rogers from Washington State. Oh, yeah, turn on it. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Zuckerberg, for joining us. Today is clearly timely. There's a number of extremely important questions Americans have about Facebook, including questions about safety and security of their data, about the process by which their data is made available to third parties, about what Facebook is doing to protect consumer privacy as we move forward. But one of the issues that is concerning me, and I'd like to dig a little deeper into, is how Facebook treats content on its platform. So, Mr. Zuckerberg, given the extensive reach of Facebook and its widespread use as a tool of public expression, do you think Facebook has the unique responsibility to ensure that it has clear standards regarding the censorship of content on its platform? And do you think Facebook adequately and clearly defines what these standards are for its users? Congresswoman, yes, I feel like we have a, a, a very important responsibility to outline what the content policies are and the community standards are. This is one of the areas that, that, frankly, I'm worried we're not doing a good enough job at right now, especially because as an American-based company where about 90% of the people in our community are outside of the U.S. where there are different social norms and, and different cultures, it's not clear to me that our current situation of how we define community standards is going to be effective for articulating that around the world. So we're looking at different ways to evolve that, and I think that this is one of the more important things that we will do. Okay, and, and even focusing on content for here in America, I'd like to shift gears just a little bit and talk about Facebook's recent changes to its news feed algorithm. Your head of news partnerships recently said that Facebook is, quote, taking a step to define what quality news looks like and give that a boost so that overall there is a less, there's less competition from news. Can you tell me what she means by less competition from news? And also, how does Facebook objectively determine what is acceptable news and what safeguards exist to ensure that, say, religious or conservative content is treated fairly? Yes, Congresswoman. I, I'm not sure specifically what that person was referring to, but I can walk you through what the algorithm change was, if that's useful. Well, maybe I'll just go on to my other questions then. Um, there's an issue of content discrimination. And it's not a problem unique to Facebook. There's a number of high-profile examples of edge providers engaging in blocking and censoring religious and conservative political content. In November, FCC Chairman Pai even said that edge providers routinely block or discriminate against content they don't like. This is obviously a serious allegation. How would you respond to such an allegation? And what is Facebook doing to ensure that its users are being treated fairly and objectively by content reviewers? Congresswoman, the principle that we're a platform for all ideas is something that I care very deeply about. I am worried about bias, and we take a number of steps to make sure that none of the changes that we make are targeted at, at, in any kind of biased way. Uh, and I'd be happy to follow up with you and go into more detail on that, because I agree that this is a serious issue. Over Easter, a Catholic university's ad with a picture of a historic San Diego cross was rejected by Facebook. Though Facebook addressed the air within days, that it happened at all is deeply disturbing. Could you tell me what was so shocking, sensational, or excessively violent 
about the ad to cause it to be initially censored? Given that your company has since said it did not violate terms of service, how can users know that their content is being viewed and judged accordingly to objective standards? Congresswoman, it sounds like we made a mistake there. I apologize for that. And unfortunately, with the amount of content in our systems and the current systems that we have in place to review, we make a relatively small percent of mistakes in content review, but that can be, that's, that's too many. And this is an area where we need to improve. What I, what I will say is that um, I, I wouldn't extrapolate from a few examples to assuming that the overall system is biased. I, I get how people can, um, can look at that and draw that conclusion, but I don't think that that reflects the, uh, the way that we're trying to build the system or what we've seen. Generally, Thank you, and I, I, I just, this, um, this is an important issue in building trust, and I that agree. is going to be important as we move forward. Thank you, and I yield. Generally, time's expired. And that is a key thing about building trust, especially after, uh, you know, what we've seen so far. Now, Ted Cruz really took Zuckerberg to task. Over Section 230, the Communications Decency Act, let's take a look at what Senator Cruz has to say. Blumenthal, Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Zuckerberg, welcome. Thank you for being here. Mr. Zuckerberg, does Facebook consider itself a neutral public forum? Senator, we consider ourselves to be a platform for all ideas. Uh, let me ask the question again. Does Facebook consider itself to be a neutral public forum? And representatives of your company have given conflicting answers on this. Are, are you a First well, Amendment speaker expressing your views, or are you a neutral public forum allowing everyone to speak? Uh, Senator, here's how we think about this. I don't believe that terrorist content, um, nudity, anything that makes people feel unsafe in, in the community. Uh, from that perspective, that's why we generally try to refer to what we do okay. as a platform let, for let all ideas. Let me ideas. try just because the time is constrained. It's just a, a simple question. The predicate for, for Section 230 immunity under the CB, CDA is that you are a neutral public forum. Do you consider yourself a neutral public forum or are you engaged in political speech, which is your right under the First Amendment? Well, Senator, our goal is certainly not to engage in political speech. I'm not that familiar with the specific legal language of the, the law that you, that you speak to, so I, I would need to follow up with you on that. I'm just trying to lay out how broadly I think about this. Well, Mr. Zuckerberg, I will say there are a great many Americans who I think are deeply concerned that, that Facebook and other tech companies are engaged in a pervasive pattern of bias and political censorship. Uh, there have been numerous instances with Facebook. In May of 2016, Gizmodo reported that Facebook had purposely and routinely suppressed conservative stories from trending news, including stories about CPAC, including stories about Mitt Romney, including stories about the Lois Lerner IRS scandal, including stories about Glenn Beck. In addition to that, Facebook has initially shut down the Chick-fil-A Appreciation Day page, has blocked a post of a Fox News reporter, has blocked over two dozen Catholic pages, and most recently blocked Trump supporters Diamond and Silk's page with 1.2 million Facebook followers after determining their content and brand were, quote, unsafe to the community. To a great many Americans, that appears to be a pervasive pattern of political bias. Do you agree with that assessment? Senator, let me say a few things about this. First, I understand where that concern is coming from because Facebook and the tech industry are located in Silicon Valley, which is an extremely left-leaning place. And uh, I, this is actually a concern that I have and that I try to root out at the company is making sure that we don't have um, any bias in the work that we do. And I think it is a fair concern that, um, that people would, so, would so let at me, least let me, wonder about. Let me ask this now, question. Are, are you aware of any ad or page that has been taken down from Planned Parenthood? Senator, I, I'm, I'm not, but let me just... Uh, how about moveon.org? Sorry? How about moveon.org? I'm not specifically aware of those. How about places. any Democratic candidate for office? I, I'm not specifically aware. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. In your testimony, you say that you have 15 to 20,000 people working on security and content review. Do you know the political orientation of those 15 to 20,000 people engaged in content review? 
Uh, no, Senator, we do not generally ask people about their political orientation when they're joining the company. So as CEO, have you ever made hiring or firing decisions based on political positions or what candidates they supported? No. Why was Palmer Lucky fired? That is a specific personnel matter that seems like it would be inappropriate to You just made to a here. specific representation that you didn't make decisions based on political views. Well, is that I, can, I can commit that it was not because of a political view. Do you know of those 15 to 20,000 people engaged in content review, how many, if any, have ever supported financially a Republican candidate for office? Senator, I do not know that. Your testimony says, it is not enough that we just connect people. We have to make sure those connections are positive. It says we have to make sure people aren't using their voice to hurt people or spread misinformation. We have a responsibility not just to build tools, to make sure those tools are used for good. Mr. Zuckerberg, do you feel it's your responsibility to assess users, whether they are good and positive connections or ones that those 15 to 20,000 people deem unacceptable or deplorable? Senator, are you asking about me personally? Facebook. Uh, Senator, I think that there are a number of things that we would all agree are clearly bad. Foreign interference in our elections, terrorism, uh, self-harm. I'm Those talking are about things. censorship. Uh, well, I, I think that you would probably agree that we should remove terrorist propaganda from the service. So that, I, I agree, uh, I think is, is clearly bad activity that we want to get down. And we're generally proud of, of how well we, we do with that. Yeah. Now, what I can say, and, and, I, and I do want to get this in before the end here, is that I am, I am very committed to making sure that Facebook is a platform for all ideas. That is a, a very important founding principle of, of what we do. Um, we're proud of the discourse and the different ideas that people can share on the service. And that is something that, as long as I'm running the company, I'm going to be committed to making sure is the case. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cruz. Do you want a break now? <laughs> or do you want to keep going? <laughs> sure. I mean, that was, that was pretty good. So. <laughs> Of course, he's going to be sure and committed to that case simply because he kind of got caught. Now, uh, what we weren't able to show you was the, his, you know, he's being grilled by Republicans here, but when you look at when he answers questions from Democrats, he's all smiling giddy there. there obviously, that Zuckerberg has his own political bias, which comes out. It's a human nature thing. But now that he's been on the hot seat and questioned, well, yeah, he's going to take things seriously. But did he take things seriously in 2015 or 14 or 11? You know, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, you know, uh, investigation back in 2011. Did he take things seriously then? I don't think so. I'm hoping that this is a wake-up call to Mark Zuckerberg. I honestly, I honestly do. Um, one other person who feels much the same way is Senator John Kennedy. Mr. Zuckerberg, I come in peace. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to vote to have to regulate Facebook, but by God, I will. But that, a lot of that depends on you. Uh, I'm a little disappointed in this hearing today. I just don't feel like that we're connecting. So, so let me try to lay it out for you from my point of view. I think you're a really smart guy. And I think you have built an extraordinary American company. And you've done a lot of good. Some of the things that you've been able to do are magical. But our, our promised digital utopia, we have discovered, has minefields. There, there are some impurities in the Facebook punch bowl. And they got to be fixed. And I think you can fix them. Now, here, here's what's going to happen. There are going to be a whole bunch of bills introduced to regulate Facebook. It's up to you whether they pass or not. You can go back home, uh, spend $10 million on lobbyists and fight us, or you can go back home and uh, help us solve this problem. And there are two. One's a privacy problem. The other one is what I call a propaganda problem. Let's start with the privacy problem first. Let's start with the user agreement. 
Here's what everybody's been trying to tell you today, and I, I, I say this gently. Your user agreement sucks. <laughs> You're a, you, you, you can spot me 75 IQ points. If I can figure it out, you can figure it out. The purpose of that user agreement is to cover Facebook's rear end. It's not to inform your users about their rights. Now, you know that, and I know that. I'm going to suggest to you that you go back home and rewrite it. And tell your $1,200 an hour lawyers, no disrespect, they're good. But, but tell them you want it written in English, in non-Swahili, so the average American can understand it. That would be a start. I, are, are you willing, as a Facebook user, are you, are you willing to give me more control over my data? Senator, as someone who uses Facebook, I believe that you should have complete control over your data. Okay. Are, are you willing to uh, go back and, and, and work on, on giving me a greater right to erase my data? Senator, you can already delete any of the data that's there are, or delete all of your data. Are you willing to expand that, work on expanding that? Senator, I think we already do what you're referring to, but certainly we're always working on trying to make these controls easier. Are, are you willing to expand my right to know who you're sharing my data with? Senator, we already give you a list of apps that, that you're using, and you signed into those yourself and provided affirmative consent. Right. As on I've said user, before, we that, don't share any that, data on with... that user agreement. Uh, are, are you willing to uh, expand my right to prohibit you from sharing my data? Senator, again, I believe that you already have that control. So, I, I mean, I think people have that, that full control in the system already today. Uh, if we're not communicating this clearly, then that's a big thing that we should work on, because I think the principles that you're articulating are the ones that we believe in and try to codify in the product that we build. Are, are you willing to give me the right to take my data on Facebook and move it to another social media platform? Senator, you can already do that. We have a download your information tool where you can go, get a file of all the content there, and then do whatever you want with it. And you're, are you, then I assume you're willing to give me the right to say, I'm gonna go on your platform and you're going to be able to tell a lot about me as a result, but I don't want you to share it with anybody. Yes, Senator, and I believe you already have that ability today. People can sign on and choose to not share things and just follow some friends or some pages and read content if that's what they want to do. Okay. Um, let me be sure I understand. I'm about out of time. Boy, it goes fast, doesn't it? Let me ask you one final question question in my 12 seconds. Could somebody call you up and say, I want to see John Kennedy's file? Absolutely not. Could you, if it, not, not, could you, not would you do it, could you do it? Uh, in, in theory. Do you have the right to put my data, a name on my data and share it with somebody? I do not believe we have the right to do that. Do you have the ability? Senator, the data is in the system, do so... Do you have the ability? Technically, I think someone could do that, but that would be a massive breach, so we would never do that. It would be a breach. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, to wrap up, first of all, uh, I'm not going to really go too much into what uh, Senator Kennedy had to say uh, in the interest of time, other than to say if you go to https colon forward slash forward slash www.facebook.com forward slash ads, ads, forward slash preferences, then scroll down to where it says your information and look at the box that says U.S. politics. Facebook has already identified your political leanings based upon certain demographic information that it keeps about you. So if you want to know how does, how does this entire exchange deal with you personally, that's what you can do. Facebook's already got you pegged. They, you know, they say uh, we're going to highlight ads, we're going to push content out to you. Well, first of all, you're already identified. The algorithms are already set and they know 
how you are. Now, it's not based on your birth date and friends. It's not based upon your birth date. It's not based upon your friends. It's based upon what you have a history of clicking on and checking uh, throughout your history as a Facebook user. And I'm actually just looking at mine, and I know what mine says. And they actually have it pretty correct. I'm going to keep that one to myself. Uh, privacy issue. Um, but the fact is, Facebook already has this information. And now, this is the, one of the keys to why we had Zuckerberg testi testifying for 10 hours, was what does Facebook do with it? And if they already have me pegged as something, does that information stay on file forever or how long? What, does, what do they do with it behind closed doors? That's the big question. Of course, we don't really have true answers with that yet. But I'm going to leave you with this, that throughout history, there becomes a certain point in a new industry where standardization and professionalization occurs. And with social media, we're kind of at that point. Take a look at the airline industry. The airplane. 1920s, you could go out and buy a kit and fly an airplane out of your backyard. You didn't need a license. The next thing you know, you have airports and then you have the Federal Aviation Administration. You have the same thing with automobiles. You could buy a car, drive it anywhere. Nobody needed training. Nobody needed a license. Then eventually we had to build roads and then we had to get, you had to go and buy a driver's license. Uh, same thing with uh, accountants and financial professionals and those dealing with stock trading. The Securities Exchange Commission was created in the 1930s because there were problems. An industry grows and gets out of its growth stage and it's into its mature stage and that's when you have things like this happen which force a certain level of professionalization. Whether it's Google, whether it's Facebook, whether it is uh, any other type of social media company, there's got to be a certain level of professional standards, especially in ethics. In ethics and business, this is where we're at right now. What are those ethical standards? We already have the Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, uh, kind of as an uh, a, uh, overriding governor, but the industry itself is going to be faced now with professionalization. Now, they can either do it the easy way or the hard way. The easy way is for them to get together and say, we better take care of this before somebody else does and do, does it internally. That's pretty much what Senator Kennedy was getting at in his remarks. Or you're going to have Congress and you're going to have state legislatures and governors throughout the entire country starting to make those standards arbitrary and enforce them and impose them on social media companies. That's where we're at. Now with Mark Zuckerberg, I think he is a great programmer. I think he did a great job when he created this tool at Harvard University in order to, you know, it started off comparing how uh, guys rated women. That's how it started. But then Facebook was created. It has grown. YouTube, Google, they've created and grown. The thing with Facebook is Zuckerberg's a great programmer. I don't think he's a great CEO. And I think what Zuckerberg, this is my own personal advice, what Zuckerberg should do is actually step down as CEO, remain as chairman of the board, and actually hire a comp competent CEO to bring Facebook to that next level, bringing in professionalization and standardization. That's just my opinion. So take it for what it's worth. Uh, there was 10 hours of testimony. A lot of time, a lot of interesting, intriguing uh, discussions. Um, but life goes on and we'll see exactly where this goes. And since we are pretty much out of time for Dallas Pearson, our producer, I'm Jeff Williams, your host. You're watching North Star Oasis, reminding you we have 256 shopping days left until Christmas. Thank you for watching. See you next week.